Hello everyone, I'm Connor and welcome to the Intelligence Squared Economic Outlook in partnership with Guinness Global Investors. We're delighted to be here this evening and to have Martin Wolf and Johnny Diamond with us here. I'll be handing you over in just a second, but first, just a few quick things. The first is to say, if you want to delve a bit deeper into the subjects discussed tonight, Martin's latest book, The Crisis of Democratic Capitalism, is just out in paper book and we're selling copies downstairs and he said he's happy to stick around and sign a few, so do stick around for that. The other thing to say is we're really excited about this new series, the Intelligence Squared Economic Outlook, and we'll be hosting four throughout the year. The next is with Kei Jin, the uh, academic and economist who will be taking us through what's happening in China and Asia. So do, do, uh, do look out for that on the Intelligence Squared website. The final thing to say is, of course, we're really excited to be working with Guinness Global Investors as part of this series. And for those that don't know, Guinness Global Investors is an independent British fund manager that helps both individuals and uh, institutions harness the future drivers of growth to achieve their investment goals and with specialisms in innovation, Asia, sustainability and income investing. They offer funds for the core of any equity portfolio. So for more information on Guinness, just go to the website or speak to your financial advisor. That's all from me, and I'm going to hand you over to our chair this evening. Please give a warm welcome tonight to BBC News journalist and royal correspondent, Johnny Diamond. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Connor. Um, hello and welcome, and thank you for making your way through the eternal rain of today and this evening to come here tonight. And welcome to Intelligence Squared Economic Outlook in partnership with Guinness Global Investors, to whom, to whom I must offer my own personal thanks. Thank you for all your assistance in making this event happen tonight. I'm Johnny Diamond, and of course, uh, I'm with me tonight is Martin Wolf, who you will not have an extensive introduction of because he is the reason you have come here and presumably waiting to listen to. However, he is Chief Economics Commentator for the Financial Times. Uh, to go back a little, he was an, a member of the UK Vickers Commission on Banking, which reported in 2011 after the financial crisis. Uh, he has been awarded the CBE for his services to financial journalism. There was a fairly robust discussion backstage about the rights and wrongs of taking the CBE. He spanked me quite thoroughly when it came to that one. Um, and his latest book, which I, I really can recommend extremely strongly, uh, not just for the robustness of the ideas, but for the quality of the writing and also the personal touches that there are throughout it. His latest book is The Crisis of Democratic Capitalism. I haven't quite finished it yet, I have to admit, and I will, when I ask him about it, issue a spoiler alert over the general framework, but that is later on in this evening's uh, agenda. Um, just so you know the structure of it today, um, I will um, lob uh, short and hopefully pertinent questions at Martin for about 40 minutes. Um, and then we'll hand it over to you uh, to put your questions to him, questions both from the audience here and also the audience online. I get the audience uh, questions online on this little screen in front of me. We really do encourage them, and we encourage everybody to ask questions as well from throughout the audience. So um, I'll stop the introduction now. Um, I'm going to start, if I may, Martin, um, just with a couple of big picture questions. First of all, um, you know, one of your areas of expertise is taking a big look at the global economy. How do you see it at the moment? How do you see it, I suppose, over the next 12 months? Okay. I should say, by the way, I, I love the introduction of my book. And if you haven't finished it, I'm afraid it doesn't yet have a happy ending. Right. Well, this uh, was, this was the, to be the first question. We'll come to that. Uh, one can live in hope, but we have uh, uh, a few things. So, the next 12 months. I'm not very good on the next 12 months because I don't think... Um, we know enough. In some way, I think we know more about the long run than we do about the next 12 months, mm -hmm. in the sense that there are some perfectly predictable uh, forecasts out there, IMF, OECD, and so forth. They will be wrong, uh, but they probably won't be enormously wrong unless something big happens. Mm -hmm. like, and if something big happens, as we have surely seen in the last four years, these forecasts will be completely worthless. So, my answer is to you that question is if you want to know what's going to happen in the next 12 months, look up the latest consensus of economic forecasts or one of these conventional forecasts. Say to yourself, 
That's probably what will happen if nothing spectacularly wrong happens. There's a pretty good chance, but we have no idea what the probability is that something like that will happen, in which case it'll be irrelevant. So the, the, the really <laughs> important, I think of this in a different way, which so just to Please. respond to you, I think of there are some very big long-term drivers which we do know about. There are things we know, and then there are lots of possible shocks whose probabilities we don't know with any accuracy, but we know they can happen, and we've just run through a whole slew of them. And then we can talk about where we are now. We're recovering from, a, we're essentially at the world economic, economic level, we are recovering from that series of shocks with the drivers, these drivers I mentioned, shaping it. And so thinking about where we're going really rests on what did those shocks do to us? And you think of the war, the, the pandemic, the post-pandemic infl inflation, uh, the Ukraine war, now the Middle East war, and the uncertainties those create, and their immediate impact, inflation and so forth. So we can think about that. Will they disappear? I think the shocks of all those things will probably disappear if nothing gets worse. And we'll go back to pretty modest growth in the world economy and in our economies. When you sort of do a little bit of crystal ball work, how much weight do you place on the result of the US election to come as an uh, uncertainty factor? That, that's obviously a, a big uncertainty, but at the moment I would say it's more political than economic in the short term. Uh, well, by short term, for me, is several years. I work more by trying to understand the underlying forces in the world economy. Mm -hmm. So short term forecasting, so many people do it and they have much more resources. But if I look at, let's assume that, well, if Biden is re-elected, we know basically what his policies are going to be. If Trump is uh, elected, we, I think, know roughly three things. It's going to be very challenging for American democracy, which might be important in the longer term, but probably not significant in the short run. He is going to do some very big things on trade policy. That's pretty clear. And the impact of that is difficult to work out. Um, and his fiscal policy will probably be even more expansionary than Biden's. And the, those are, I think, the things we know about what, from an economic point of view, what the Trump election will mean. And so the big imponderable is what a very high uniform tariff, which I think is what he's going to try and introduce, and a massive penal uh, tariff on Chinese exports to the US, what that will do. And since we've not been in a situation where the US has done something like that since the early 30s, we don't really know, but I suspect it will be a mess. Um, drawing back from the global for a moment and bringing it back to the domestic, um, how much more exposed do you think the UK economy is to all the different risks there are swirling out there and how much greater are the risks um, to the economy than they were, say, five years ago? I would have thought, I may be missing something, but not much more. I mean, the, the UK is a small open economy in this context. Everybody that isn't the US or China or the EU as a whole is a small open economy. Um, uh, the, um, and so big things that happen in the world will affect it. That's absolutely clear. Uh, so if we have a, a big tariff imposed upon us in our exports to the US, that will affect British business. It's not our biggest market, second biggest after the EU, but it will be a clearly negative shock. Uh, how big that will be for our economy, difficult to tell. Um, the, uh, but obviously, if there's any shocks like what we've seen recently, another pandemic, a, a war getting much more serious, a massive uh, rise in oil prices, uh, a collapse in world trade, anything like that, yeah, of course Britain will be affected because we're a small open economy. I mean, I talk about five years because I suppose five years ago as well, we were pre-COVID debt um, and arguably I don't underlying, that, you don't need underlying persuade, finances. Well, the, our debt is higher than it was then. It's very difficult to say with any precision that level was in 
perfectly manageable and the current level is not. The big question here, which is more a longer run one, is which is important, is mm. the future of interest rates. Yeah. If we've got a debt, for, I mean, this is always one of my fun things, how much debt is too much? Um, so I think net debt, about 100% of GDP or so, um, we'll see what they announce. Mm. I always like to point out that twice in our history, it's been 250%. Mm. So British people could be right relaxed. Of course, we were had a different position in the world, but you can't say this is too much. Right. It isn't. If real interest rates, however, are, um, are significantly above the growth rate, uh, so let's assume that the trend growth of the British economy, I think the OBI is too optimistic, is somewhere between one and one and a half percent. So let's assume the real interest rate is two or two and a half, which is not conceivable from past standards. Then that, what that means is if we want to stabilize the debt level, you have to have run a primary fiscal surplus, which means before interest, you have to run a primary a fiscal surplus, and we're nowhere near that. Yeah. Uh, at moment, we're not near that. So that would mean a lot of fiscal tightening. And uh, that's clearly not what anybody is really planning for, so that will be very unpleasant. But, crucially, we don't know what the future real interest rate, and we can discuss this further. I'm actually rather optimistic on that. I think there are quite, this is a bit of outside consensus for you, I think there's a quite plausible argument that after this inflation period is over, interest rates start falling, that we will end up with real interest rates that are not, not much above zero. Right. Possibly at least below one. Uh, Huge and sigh of relief this is the not Treasury. a conventional view. And the main reason for that is I don't think people have fully internalized how significant uh, the Chinese slowdown is going to be. And therefore, in terms of the net impact on the balance of savings and investment in the world economy. And um, I think the Chinese are going to emerge, China is going to emerge as a very significant excess saver again, as it was yeah. in the early 2000s, in which case it's going to be very, very hard to get real interest rates as high as so high. So this might be helpful to yeah. us. OK, I want to come back to China in a moment. First of all, I want to talk about this sort of slew of elections that there are across the world this year. Um, are they important? Do they change things? I mean, some are barely elections, where, where no one's on tenterhooks about what's going to happen in the Russian presidential elections. But overall, do you see them as important for all the many words that will be produced about them? I think they, well, I think they're politically important. Mm -hmm. uh, without a doubt, they could change things rather dramatically on the balance between democracy and dictatorship. Which worldwide. ones come to mind? Well, there's one, the two most important elections are very, very clearly India and the US. Mm -hmm. um, do I need to explain why? No. Uh, in the Indian case, however, we know what the result is going to be. Mm -hmm. So we, we will continue with Modi's um, um, experiment, experiment, his way of governing. We know what that is. It doesn't change anything. It'll be more of the same. In the US, I think the difference between Trump and Biden, as I suggested, is not outside trade policy. Economically significant, at least in the short run, by short run, I mean during this term, I think that's right. But politically, it could be very, very significant in terms of the direction of the United States, its role of the world, uh, uh, would could well be transformed very profoundly, affecting the future of NATO, uh, the, um, the you know, basically, we, let's do it. we live in the world the US created after the yeah. Second World War. I mean, we may not like that fact, I think it's better than all the alternatives, but that's the reality. If the US basically says, we don't like anything about that world. We don't like the multilateralism. We don't like these foreign entanglements. Remember, 
George Washington was very against them. We don't want, therefore, want these alliances. We have only one enemy, that's China, and we're going to try and cut it down uh, in a very, very big uh, way. And the rest of you, you're on your own. This is politically, geopolitically transformative. And if it's, in addition, America basically said, we don't really care very much about democracy either, then, of course, the world will be changed in a ways that over a reasonably long time, I mean, more than three or four years, it might be very quick, but the world will be changed. But the geopolitical dimension of this will be more significant, I think, in the relatively short term than anything apart from the trade policy in the economics. Can we talk about China? I know you've, you've just pretty much just come back from there and you were discussing a marathon series of lectures that you were given. Um, it, it, for a while, it was talked about China having to get rich before it got old, the, the demographics driving China. Is that still, as you see it, one of the, the key factors for its prosperity and, I guess, its, its region and the international prosperity around it? Well, first of all, it's getting old quite fast. Yeah. Um, Chinese people are fairly healthy. I mean, one of the statistics which I still can't get my mind around is that the life expectancy of China is now slightly above that of the United States. Um, it's pretty close, but it's above it. So there are going to be old, and um, while uh, the, the labor force is shrinking, the population is, sh is on the verge of shrinking, and the... Um, and uh, aging very rapidly in terms of proportions, and the fertility rate is really low. Yeah. So it's sort of East Asian low. Um, so uh, there, there, the aging process is really biting. And now, are they rich is a very interesting question. Um, if you look at standard international comparisons in at purchasing power, power as yeah. the purchasing power of incomes, GDP per head in China now is roughly 30% of US levels, which makes it, we are, we are roughly 70% of US levels, so you can work sure. out the, the ratio. So it's clearly not a high income country. On the other hand, when it started off the rapid growth, it was about 2%. Yeah. So... He's a hell of a sight richer. Yeah. Uh, is this something they can manage at this level of po poverty? Um, I think it's pretty clear that the government thinks they can. Uh, I mean, the one thing that I do get a sense of, uh, nothing is ever so clear, uh, lost its cure, but the priority that they gave to growth 20 years ago has clearly been reduced. There was no doubt. There are other objectives they have in mind. And the, the fact that they're, the priority they're giving to growth has been reduced, and the opportunities, of course, have shrunk because they've got so far, uh, means that if they're not rich enough to manage where they are now, yes, they, will, they should be able to get richer, um, but it's going to be more difficult. And they might not get to high-income status very quickly, in which case it's too late, or might be too late to get rich as we think of rich yeah. uh, before they get old, because they're going to be old before they get there. What of the pressures more generally from demographic change? I mean, it's, it's not just China, it's Korea, Japan, Italy, uh, you know, the slew of Western European countries are, are looking at, if not demographic collapse, then severe stresses on the system that they've built off the back of having a fat working demographic? Well, there are two ways out of this, neither of which, well, the most obvious one, which I think in the East Asian case will happen fairly easily, well, it's complicated, is retirement is off the table. Right. You know, people will work much longer. The problem with that in the, for China, which I hadn't really thought about much more than for Japan, where this is already happening, is that their old people, pretty obviously, are much less well-educated than their young. So the, the, in China's case, they've been going in the last 30 years, and I didn't really think about this so clearly until I went there. Um, they've been going through what happened with Korea, which I followed quite closely a generation ago. Um, their younger generation is really phenomenally well-educated. Mm. Uh, and 
and that and their older generation is not now the question then is uh, in this rapidly changing society will there be enough jobs of a less skilled variety that the old can usefully do? I suspect the answer is yes. There's a lot of service sector jobs mm. that will be opening up for them, but it's going to be quite tricky. But the first thing anyway you can do is postpone retirement, and that's gonna happen all over the world. Um, and in Japan, that's already happening to a significant degree. The other thing you can do, of course, is open yourself up to immigration, uh, which creates lots of controversy. And the, I'm not going to get into the European debate. I'm pretty clear where it's heading. But I think you can safely say that the Japanese, uh, South Koreans, and Chinese either cannot or will not accept mass immigration. And in China's case, where else could they come from at the level, the scale they would need and would still fit into their country? There isn't anybody. So that's not going to work. So the conclusion of this is the main adjustment is going to be uh, postponing um, uh, retirement. So basically you retire shortly before you die. And the, and the which is my working model, by the way. I, I, and the, We're all very grateful. And, and the, uh, well, it's easier doing perhaps what I do. And, and the, and the, uh, and otherwise you just have to live with what's going on because this fertility rate is not going to change. So uh, it's going to be difficult, but there isn't any alternative to adjusting to it. And it will mean, of course, a very heavy burden uh, directly in looking after their own elders and indirectly through taxes or other means, a uh, very heavy burden on the smaller labor force. How much, if at all, does technology ride to the rescue? I mean, AI is currently spoken of in the same way that the internet was in the 90s. Vast leaps in productivity suggested as a result of it. Do you see the two coming together? Well, that would be the most cheerful view. Go on. <laughs> uh, and the, I mean, the, it's very, very interesting. So I'm just generally agnostic on this. The uh, 30 years ago or so, there's been a long-standing debate among economists on the line, which goes back to a wonderful comment by the late uh, Rob, Bob Solo, Robert Solo, mm -hmm. who died this year, last year now, I suppose, uh, um, who said in, the, I think, 87, something like that, uh, you, uh, that the computers can be seen everywhere except in the productivity statistics. Uh, I'm sure many of you must know this line. And the point is, um, over the last 30 years, since the early 90s, we've been constantly told about how the miracles of new technology will transform productivity. And we certainly don't see them in the statistics. It's been rather a poor period in general for productivity growth. And there are two possible explanations. One, it's really true that productivity growth is slow. Or two, we're just mismeasuring it. Yeah. I think it's a bit of both, probably, but I think it's more the former than the latter. I don't think mismeasurement explains it all. Now, so we've really had rather a disappointing results of this. I could go into why I think it, it, that's plausible, that really it is a disappointment, but put that to one side. We've now got this new stuff called artificial intelligence, which by the way isn't in the least intelligent. It, this is not how it works. These are statistical processing systems. Sure. Um, maybe this time we will really have massive labor augmenting technical progress, making the labor more productive in this way. Uh, so it will generate opportunities for work, for work, the workers and economic output. And that will be transformative uh, for the economy, in which case clearly in an economy where productivity growth is much higher, the beauty of that is that even if the labor force is shrinking, you might have more of so much stuff in some way that people will feel everybody can get better off. If that doesn't happen, the old and the young, as yeah. it were, if that doesn't happen, you get distributional questions. And what I was suggesting in my answer to you earlier yeah. is the distributional question will be resolved uh, in many countries by increasing the burden on the young to support the old, which isn't going to be very nice, and we've seen lots of that already. Yeah. So the... Um, I hope that the view that productivity growth will explode upward is correct. Now, 
The only little optimistic sign we're seeing is that in the, in the emergence from the most recent series of shocks, the US, which is obviously the frontier of, in, does seem to be producing a better productivity performance than before. Mm. It's not dramatically better, but it's a bit better. And that's, if you're optimistic, would suggest maybe this new technology is really delivering something and that then could be used by the, all the other countries like ours with terrible yeah. productivity records. And that will start solving this negative sum problem we have with stagnant economies and rising proportions of old people and we don't want any immigrants so how are we going to fix this well maybe this is going to be the manna from heaven we need but at this stage I think all we can say is we don't know. Can I ask you about that, that, that little gloomy trifecta you gave us just earlier about stagnant productivity um, in Western economies, in particular, of course, European about, economies. Yeah, European and, economies. And, 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 uh, and let, decisively, well. unfortunately, here. Exactly. Let's focus on here. I mean, we, you know, until, what, between the 50s and the uh, late 80s, we had the 30 glorious years of growth. And it was, you know, the, the place got richer and richer and richer. Broadly speaking, there has been a, a, a slowdown and, and a stagnation in a fair number of countries since then. Do you see any opportunity for countries like Britain uh, and other Western European countries which are stagnated to, to get out of that low productivity trap? Well, the logic of the opportunity, if you're optimistic, uh, and I'm going to put aside all the possible constraints, most notably the environmental, is, yeah. as I said, per capita GDP in Britain, Italy, quite a few other countries, Japan, uh, um, Spain, so forth, it, are sort of round 70, 75% of US levels. It's rough and ready. So, um, well, there's an opportunity to be that, to hit that. Now, there are some reasons why the US can achieve measured productivity uh, that we will never do because land is super abundant and they can operate in, with economies of scale that we simply can't. But still, we've been falling behind for a while, so uh, relative to the US since to, um, over the last 15 years. So one would think there are some opportunities yeah. to exploit these technologies. Um, so that's the first opportunity, catch up. There's, you know, we're behind. The second opportunity, as we discussed, is there's exciting new technologies, yeah. which are general purpose technologies, as they're called, which uh, might include, might, though I think it's more questionable, renewable energies in, from the point of view of actually lowering energy costs, and some of them would, um, but above all in the ability to process and manage information, which is a core aspect of our, society, of our economy, that might allow productivity growth to explode. And in the UK case, to some extent, I don't want to exaggerate this because we do understand some of it, the, the stagnation that hit us since um, the financial crisis has been a puzzle. So uh, it wasn't expected, and it's still not completely clear why it's happened. Mm. So maybe with these new technologies coming along, we'll suddenly find that productivity starts improving. It's what the OBR is hoping for. Um, uh, but since we don't really know why it stopped, uh, and why, and I think that it had, or well, more stuff, and it's, and I think this, I did, this is a really big point, that once business gets used to the idea that they're operating in a stagnant economy, they base their plans on that, and that becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy, but you could be optimistic that this will change around. Uh, but we collapsed from being one of the fastest growing countries in terms of productivity between roughly the early 80s and 2007 to being just ahead of Italy. And um, that's pretty d disturbing. Can I just pick you up on one, one thing you, you made a reference to in that explanation? You spoke about environmental conditions as a constraint. Now, if you talk to politicians selling you their, their plans, they'll talk about all the jobs that are going to come out of and the environmental revolution. You see it as essentially a something well, of a straitjacket on the economy. The, the, yeah, I mean, sort of standard economics, I tend to think that you... Um, that the determinants of employment and in the economy, of employment and unemployment, are not sectoral specific, uh, sector right. specific growth. That is determined by do you have a sufficiently 
powerful aggregate demand. You have to do that, and that's obviously been a problem with the high inflation, but presumably will pass. And do you have a by and large sufficiently supportive policies to get people into work. So to a first approximation, I would say, well, if we have lots and lots of jobs in the new green energy things, then that will be the price of lots of jobs somewhere else in some other right. sector. It's not a net. Of course, it can be sold by politicians. And if that's the only way to sell people on the idea of the climate transition, that's fine. That's what they're doing. But I don't think that's what will determine aggregate, aggregate employment. The key question in terms, you know, the argument for doing the shift is you're dealing with an externality, namely the environmental costs of fossil fuels. And that's something one ought to do, no question about it. But it doesn't, and because the externality is very damaging and we want to get rid sure. of that. The, the, the negative cost of having a fossil fuel-based economy is very clear. But in terms of um, the visible, uh, and uh, excluding environmental effects, um, products of the economy to the people who are consuming the products of the mm. economy, what is relevant is the new energy system cheaper to them yep. than the old one. Uh, and that sort of what... And so far as we I know at the moment, it isn't. Right. It's getting closer, yep. and it might end up much cheaper. And, of course, if we ended up with... You know, if, let's suppose we ended up with limitless nuclear fusion. Sure. Then we're in a completely different world. But as it is at the moment, if you take the systems cost, total systems cost of the transition, we're not yet at the stage when the, we're going to pay, therefore, a price in the visible economy in order to get rid of an externality, which is the right thing to do. But we shouldn't pretend, in my view, because I think it's not honest, that in the process of getting rid of this very important negative externality, God, that terrible terminology, I know, <laughs> uh, the, uh, the climate disaster, as it were, that yes. we're also all going to have more stuff. That seems to me not true, at least on the basis of where we are, though we're getting closer to it. So it's not a magic wand that will both get rid of... Uh, uh, of the dangers of climate change and make us all feel much better off. Let me ask you to put your hands again onto the crystal ball. And even if you don't want to come up with um, some numbers, what I'm interested in is what you see as the major risks to the economy in the, what, the 12 months, 24 months, 36 months ahead. The, 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 the big headlines that come to you. Well, I think the big headlines follow from what we talked to earlier, which are broadly geopolitics, of which the, uh, I mean, I'm not going to talk about whether there's going to be another pandemic, no idea. Uh, but if you look at the other major risks out there, um, there are basic, there are two clubs, there are two that seem to me interesting. Um, one is financial crisis. And the, the, uh, the, the argument for why there might be a financial crisis is we have more debt in the world, that basically relative to world output than we've ever had before. And it's, um, but whether that triggers a financial crisis really does seem to me depend on the interest rate environment and against that. And at the moment, I'm broadly optimistic that that's going to get better. I could be wrong, but I think it's, inflation will get better, real interest rates are going to fall. And so I'm not convinced at the moment, famous last words, yeah, that there's going to be a huge world transforming financial crisis. I'm not talking about no. the banking crisis of a year ago in America. I'm talking about something really big. The, the second set of risks are geopolitical in the very simple sense, to come it down, a colossal trade war that basically implodes huge parts of world trade. And uh, that is a real risk, and I discussed that already. And the other one, of course, is the, I think the most important ones, I'm not, Ukraine war um, gets much worse and possibly goes nuclear. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot of discussion in the paper yep. recently about that. Uh, China-US, a conflict, um, 
most obviously over Taiwan. I'm not saying there's any profit, but clearly non-zero. And at the moment, I don't think this is likely from a Jew. And the, but I discussed this earlier, that the, that the Middle East war spreads enormously and becomes a regional war, which affects the, I mean, talking about the economic. I'm yep. not going to talk about yep. people. Uh, and basically disrupts the flow of oil, uh, big time. Yeah. Uh, closes the straits, damages sick shipping in, in the Gulf, and that's also a mega shock. So geopolitics, <coughs> including trade wars, seem to me the most obvious vulnerability in a system because you know, international relations at the moment are really fraught. <coughs> and if... To take one example, Trump comes along and says to China, you've got a 60% tariff. And um, the Chinese say, okay, this is war. This is an act of economic warfare. And we're going to retaliate in the following ways. <coughs> that starts triggering both trade effects, other economic effects, massive increases in uncertainty and possible conflict. And that sort of reminds one of what happened in the 30s. OK. Um, I'm going to come to questions in just a moment. We're running a little bit late because we, everyone came in late, um, uh, which is probably my fault for turning up late, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, but to, just two or three minutes before we come to questions. They're coming in um, from our online audience, which is lovely, and I want to hear from uh, the audience here as well. Um, I want to talk to you briefly about your book. Um, there are parts of it um, that feel like a reminiscence for um, democratic capitalism, as if it is a sort of a fond look back. Nostalgia. Yes. Um, I hope not. I, I mean, is it unfair describing it as such? Do you feel it's slightly, you're looking at something in the rearview mirror? Well, I think, I hope not. Uh, the book was written with the hope that we would fix all these problems. Uh, I have to admit that my analysis of what's wrong is probably more compelling than my, set, my chapters on how we're going to fix it. The, the, let me put it this way. Uh, we are not in a place that 30 years ago I imagined. Yeah. And so I have to admit my uh, naivete or folly. It, it, you know, somebody... People occasionally criticise me for being too pessimistic. And my only good answer, well, I have two answers. One is I'm pessimistic because two men, my father and grandfather, were very pessimistic and left Nazi Europe before they got murdered. The, the, but the more important reason is the only times I've ever been really, really wrong was when I was optimistic. So I tried to avoid, <laughs> so I tried to avoid yeah. that mistake. But yes, the, I think... It's pretty obvious. Um, two things are pretty obvious. We have a very, very large number of people in all our Western societies, I'm not going to talk about the rest of the world, mm -hmm. who are really pretty unhappy with the way things are working. Yeah. They feel total contempt for the political class, the political system, and most of the technocracy. And that's really pretty bad. Because it means that if they're in this, they're quite happy to listen to, at least, what I, some people now call anti-system politicians. Uh, and the second thing that uh, seems to be clear is that because of that, because of the loss of trust in the system, politicians seem to find in all our countries, it's not unique, unique to Britain, though Britain and America is only something, that they, they really don't want to listen to, de to have be engaged in any decent, conscious, deliberate policy discussion because they don't believe it'll ever work. And so why should they? And, uh, and they increasingly see politics as a purely, I mean, it's always had this element, uh, sort of a mixture of uh, a, sporting, uh, a sporting activity and an entertainment rather than a matter of life and death for them and their future because they just don't think it's serious, even if they... Uh, so with a mixture of contempt and anger on part of the polit people and the politicians responding by absolutely offering nothing whatsoever. This isn't, I think, been so true of Biden, but it seems to me where we're going here. Uh, the, um, the result is it's very difficult for me at the moment to see how we get out of where we are 
towards a place where people actually think these politicians, they're really trying to do something. And, and if I look back on the great periods of change where we were successful in changing, uh, the, the New Deal in America in the 30s and the post-war politics, not just in Britain, but in all continental European countries to create a new... We just don't seem to have the conditions for any of that in terms of what people are prepared to um, expect or hope for. And that's pretty, that is, I think, more important than where we are. And it's both of the, the, the lack the examples of hope. You cite, both of the examples you cite followed extraordinary crises as well. Well, one of the things that has surprised me is how little, I thought after the financial crisis, I wrote this in my previous book, yeah. that we would do some really quite radical things. But what has been so interesting to me is how little C conservative everything has been everywhere. And now it's moving quite rapidly into pure reaction, which is not where I had hoped to be, but pure reaction, which is essentially built on nostalgia. Uh, you know, if you've got politics which basically, what was Brexit about? Brexit was about saying, let's go back to the 1950s. Of course it was. We, let's forget this European nonsense. We're on our own, uh, gallant little Britain, and all this entanglement with the Europeans quite unnecessary. And America is even more obvious. Nostalgia is not a basis for anything. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to questions. Enough from me. Um, I'm going to uh, privilege the audience that has made its way through the ceaseless rain of today before I come to the questions online. Thank you for your questions uh, from home or from office or wherever you're watching this. I will come to them. But as I say, some people have shucked on their raincoats and come through the rain today, and I want to hear from them first. Uh, we've got microphones at the side. So I'm going to hear, first of all, the lady at the end there wearing a dark top. That's right. And then and after that, I see a hand here as well. But we'll You're take going one to remember the questions. I, 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 so I'm going to take one question, one question, and then two answers. Madam. Um, hi. This is Hello. Super, um, super interesting. But I wondered what your opinions on the developing world. Like, especially when I go to Africa, sometimes I work in Ghana and stuff. You see, you feel this sense of progress. You feel this sense of energy. Is that just a perception, or is there something changing that could be positive? Thank you very much. And was it a gentleman here? Jen. Uh, uh, thank you for the interesting discussion. Um, my question is about uh, uh, what do you think about the populism that uh, discourage the, the investment in the energy transition that make like a, a climate change worse and like a, there is a, a massive displacement of, of people that maybe increase the uh, geopolitical uh, uh, risk. So, what, what do you think, how, how the West can do better about it? Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Let's go first to the lady's question about the developing world and whether you sense a, a shift, a sense of new energy um, in, in, again, a, a phrase that covers an enormous amount of territory. Okay. Um, well, I started my career, as I th no, you didn't mention, I started my career at the World Bank back, ten year, uh, back in so long ago that I shouldn't mention it's embarrassing. Um, <laughs> And so I've always thought development is, in some sense, the great challenge. The, the answer I would give at the moment is it depends what part of the developing world you're looking at. So uh, if you look at East and South Asia, East, Southeast, and South Asia, which is roughly half the world, um, this is, there are some, there are exceptions, but basically the dynamism of that very broad region has been absolutely extraordinary, transformative. It's one of the great shifts in the world. And these countries, uh, I think the own, you know, including here Indonesia, um, all the Southeast Asian countries, Malaysia and so forth, obviously China, um, I don't need to talk about South Korea um, because it's now a developed country, Vietnam, on to Bangladesh, India. The one country which is a rather striking exception in this very boring is Pakistan. So 
And that's a sensational success. And since it includes half the world's population, it's the biggest economic story of my lifetime. It's a, a very, very famous Swedish economist who got a Nobel Prize called Gunnar Myrdal wrote a book in, I think, the end, late 50s called Asian Drama, which I read, uh, 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 not the late 60s. And, uh, and he basically said Asia is not going to work. And Asia, my God, it has worked. <laughs> the, um, unfortunately, South America has on the whole been a disappointment. Uh, there's not been much catch up there. I can discuss at length why, but that's a reality. Um, and when I have to say that after a period when things look better, uh, the story in sub Saharan Africa is concerning. And there are a whole slew of reasons for that, which I can't go into now. And that's very, very important because that's the region with the with the youngest population, the fastest growing population, it's going to be a quarter of the world's population in by the middle of this century. And we, so, so I regard Sub-Saharan Africa, which I worked on for the World Bank, as a fantastic question mark and unbelievably important, by the way, particularly for Europe. And uh, the Middle East, apart from the Gulf states and one or two others, is rather disappointing too. So I would say, it's a very, very mixed story. Uh, we could have a long discussion of why, uh, but the Asian story is the most extraordinary economic story. Uh, and at the core of it is, of course, China and now India. So, uh, and I don't need to explain why they're important. Okay, let's, uh, this gentleman's question, I think, was about constraints on environmental investment um, uh, and what you made of them and whether or not the West needed to do more. Yeah, yes, I'm, I think that I understand the question. Well, the basic answer is a necessary condition for environmental investment, if you're talking about private sector investment, it's, it's going to be a public-private partnership, we know that, everywhere, is you need predictable, certain, intelligent, carefully constructed policy. And... Uh, <laughs> It's rather hard to, I've written about this for 20 years, it's quite hard to find that. Uh, um, I mean, policy making had been at multiple levels a mess. And as long as that's the case, it's pretty difficult for the investment at the scale needed to happen. And the scale needed is amazingly large in the next 10 years or so, if we're going to get any new any of these targets, and it's not happening. And in this country, unfortunately, after quite sensible and ambitious start about 10 years ago, though, we are backsliding very, very rapidly. So um, the US has half a policy, namely investment subsidies, but it doesn't have a policy which will deal with the demand side transition. And, uh, uh, and, and this ignores what is, I think, an even, you're focusing on the West, I think. You were focusing on the West. Remember, more than half the emissions in the world come from emerging and developing countries, and it's not just China, and all the growth. I'd like to say you can fix the problem in the West, it will make no difference, except in the US, which is important. The Europeans only generate 10% of emissions, including us, 10 or 11, and they're not growing. Then they, it would be nice for them to fix it, but that's not the heart of this. If we don't have mechanisms that transform the energy systems and the growth in energy, because they are going to demand more energy, whatever you like, in the emerging developing countries, the problem can't be fixed. And we haven't got within a million miles of systems, I've written a lot about this, which will make that happen. Thank you very much. I'm going to uh, get a question from our online audience. I should have said to our online audience, uh, you can ask a question by clicking on the Q&A button underneath the video screen and then press send. But we've got some in. Um, I want to come back to home. Uh, we've got a question here. What advice would you give Sir Keir Starmer if he wins the election later this year? Fairly simple. <laughs> Uh, and, uh, how long have you got? <laughs> I, mean, I think we'll keep it to headlines again so the, we can get more questions the, from our friends here. Um, I think that's the, the most... Uh, I'm, I'm going to give uh, uh, what is sort of a cop-out in the sense 
Um, but I don't know whether it's a good answer. My instinct is to say, forget everything you promised in order to get elected. Uh, and now have some serious policy. Uh, uh, the question he's got to decide, since he's clearly going to have to break some of his promises, there's no doubt. For example, he is unquestionably going to have to increase taxes. There's just no doubt about it, because the policies into which they've been forced uh, are based on promises by the government, which everybody knows, who follows this at all, are completely unbelievable, because they assume cuts in public spending which aren't, pop aren't gonna happen. So the, uh, he's going to end up with, when he starts looking at policy seriously, with a whacking great and very rapidly growing deficit. And he's gonna to have to deal with that. He is gonna to have to decide what to do about maintaining public services. And he's almost certainly, in my view, going to end up having to spend more on defense. And all that means yeah. he's gonna to have to increase taxes. And if he's gonna increase taxes, he has to reform our lousy tax system. And that's a big enough thing. And then he's going to have to do something about how the planning system works because he's gonna to have to do something about housing. Uh, he's just gonna to have to. And uh, basically, the rate of house building is going to have to double, um, particularly given the number of immigrants we have. And I could go through this. Yeah. So he's, if he's going to be an effective government, he's going to have to break his promises. His problem is, of course, all these things are going to make him massively unpopular. And he will lose the next election or the one after that to a populist right wing, uh, completely dishonest party. Yeah. And then we're going to be in real trouble. <laughs> Let's get some more questions from the audience. Um, <laughs> on this optimistic note. Uh, right, um, we have a lady... Just Don't like, forget that I'm only uh, wrong when I'm optimistic. <laughs> I haven't forgotten, I promise you. Uh, lady over there, that's perfect. And then a uh, gentleman up there, if we could, as well. If we can get the microphone afterwards to that. Madam. Hello. Oh. Hello, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us this evening. I have two questions. The first is about... One only, one, one only, okay. really. Uh, my first question then is on the US middle class. So given over the last you know, 10, 15 years, we've seen the squeezing of the middle class, i.e. student debt levels, affordability of housing, cost of living crisis, et cetera, medical care. What is your outlook on the middle class and how do you see this affecting US performance in the long term? Thank you very much, madam. And I think we had one uh, lady here, that's fine. Um, given the UK economy is so dependent on what happens globally, both economically and politically, how effective is the role of the MPC in manipulating the base rate to stabilise our economy? Excellent. Thank you very much. Monetary Policy Committee there. We'll address the lady's question first of all, I think, on the, squeeze, the squeezing of the middle class, I think, in particular in the Was US. Was that just fact. about the UK or, or more broadly? I wasn't clear. The US. About the US primarily, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, of course, the, they mean different things, don't the, they? Because the, the middle class in the, the US is, is the, what well, we generally refer to as the working class here or the well, the well off. And the Americans class. actually, the concept of the middle class is statistically relevant. While the UK's version of the middle class is just laughable. So <laughs> I, I, let's I, go with the US then. Uh, I, what we think of the middle class is really the bulk of the upper class. But the uh, <laughs> the the just because we 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 th we think we still think we have a functioning aristocracy, and that's the upper class, and everybody else is the middle class, and that's economically absurd. Uh, so the the um, the Americans are the middle. The the American evidence suggests that what they call the middle class um, has been doing somewhat better in the last decade or so since the recovery from the crisis, and certainly better than here. We've had a long-term stagnation of median, which is the definition of the middle class, a median household income. We've had the longest period of stagnant median household income in this country since, not only since statistics were counted, but even retrospectively counted. So we really have had a bad period. And the cost of living crisis has been particularly severe here because it was also a terms of trade crisis because 
um, the price of our imports rose relative to our exports, which was very significant. So it's been really severe here. In the US, growth has been stronger, productivity growth has been stronger, and the big squeeze on the, and the rise in inequality and the squeeze on the real incomes of the middle were, was earlier. That's a complicated story, but it was earlier. So uh, they're slightly different stories. Ultimately, the, the determinants of the real incomes of the middle of the income distribution depend on two things. How fast aggregate productivity growth is, real output bad, therefore, and what happens to income distribution. In the UK, income distribution does not appear I think it have got worse since the late 80s. The big shift was under in the 80s. But productivity growth has collapsed, so everything depends on productivity growth. The, the, the cost of living crisis associated with the terms of trade shock following the Uruguay war, the Ukraine war, is now past. That's basically past. You can see this with gas prices. So it's productivity growth. In the US, it's also distribution, but at the moment is not so much of a problem. So in the US, there's a reasonable chance, if things continue as they are now, that the middle class will be getting better off. Not, that won't close the fact that the US is a highly unequal economy, much more unequal than anywhere else in the West, but it, they, there the prospects look better, simply because productivity growth looks much, much stronger and employment growth is very strong. But, so I'm a bit more optimistic about the US and a bit less, optimistic than the UK than I would have been, say, 15 years ago, because things have changed since then. Thanks very much. And the question came from the lady at the side there about... Um, ah, the, the MPC. The MPC, the Monetary the Policy Committee. The answer is... We're obviously subject to global shocks, and the sort of shocks we've experienced recently are very powerful global shocks. Um, so the inflationary process was clearly global and it affected us. Uh, but that's quite an exceptional period. In general, um, we do have <clears throat> a currency of our own. Uh, so we, we do have a monetary area, which is the sterling area. And uh, the general experience is inflation within that area can to some extent be managed on its own, to some extent. Um, but uh, the costs of doing so can be very high. I mean, essentially, you're relying on what you do, the most obvious lever for making your um, monetary area independent of what happens elsewhere is the exchange rate. And uh, monetary policy that works via the exchange rate in either directions can create some very large sectoral problems. So my answer to you to a first approximation is yes, we do have policy autonomy, and, but unfortunately, using it is very difficult and costly, and if we have a very large global process of the type that we had post-pandemic, there's no real way you can avoid it. The fortunate point is everybody is disinflating at the same time, so if the Bank of England does too, we're no worse off than anybody else. Thank you. I want to get some more questions here. Three questions in a row, if I could. Lady right at the front. Uh, we can get a microphone to her. Gentleman there after her. And then, ah, here we go. Very, very good stretching, sir. After you, afterwards there. But first of all, you, madam. We'll take three questions, then get the answers. Thank you so much for the talk. Um, I'd just like to ask about the role of the semiconductor industry in the global economy. It's kind of been a bit of a spotlight in terms of things like, you know, the US-China sanctions, um, but also the role of Taiwan in kind of geopolitical relations. Uh, it's also driving, you know, AI growth um, and the tech industry. So for you, what is the role of semiconductors going forward um, and various regions within that uh, kind of development? Thank you very much. And sir, you here? Thank you very much. We'll pass this microphone swiftly and then we'll come to you, sir, afterwards. Thank you, Martin. Um, my question is actually you've talked about uh, some pessimism on Trump coming back to power in, in the US. Uh, can you put a percentage on, on Trump coming back to power? <laughs> can I put what? A percentage. A percentage. Percentage. Yeah. percentage odds. Yeah. Okay, we'll try for that. And sir? So I'll try to keep it simple. Um, Ukraine and uh, um, combined export finance budgets, if you look at export finance budgets across G7, G20, uh, CIS, even ex-Russia, uh, these alone would probably fund the war and solve problems um, 
Georgia, for example, at the moment is down at three and a half billion just for the UK, although we're obviously not going to deploy it because of the war. So um, why are we not deploying and utilizing export finance in, in and around the Baltics and Ukraine to help solve these problems? Thank you very much indeed. First question, semiconductor industry. I'm going to ask you to keep it relatively brief, sir. <laughs> okay, relatively brief. Relatively. It, it's really important. Uh, uh, it's the basic raw material of our economy. It's spectacularly dynamic. I discovered that uh, Gordon Moore, his famous Intel law, Intel, uh, Moore's law, uh, and that's the thing, predicted that in, in his famous article in 65, that in 10 years, the number of transistors per chip might conceivably rise to 65,000. I think that I've got that number right. And I just looked the latest, and it's now 135 billion. Yeah. That's quite impressive. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a strategic industry, so it's at the center of superpower rivalry. The US has decided it doesn't want China to, to catch up. And the Chinese view that as an act of economic warfare, which of course it is. Um, they think of it as uh, essential to economic and military security, and that, and of course, the core player, the key player in manufacturing the most sophisticated chips, happens to be in Taiwan. So I think I've said enough to say that this is going to be um, interesting. And uh, the U.S. is trying to get, this is the last thing, to get the Taiwanese TSMC to produce in America. And my understanding is this is not going well. Okay. Um, now, uh, we need percentage odds on uh, uh, Donald Trump getting I, back into I, power. I, and I'm, I want to add one on, if I may, which is from the online, uh, coming online. The U.S. stock market boomed under President Trump. Would you expect a second presidency to have the same effect? But first, your odds on Donald Trump getting into power. Well, the... The US uh, stock market is booming under everybody. Right. It's booming okay. pretty well under Biden. Uh, yeah, I actually think it's quite plausible because he's going to cut taxes on business and that will affect, the, that, that will affect the, um, profits. Do you uh, the, if you think the aim of politics is to raise the stock market, he's probably quite good. So, so the, uh, the probabilities... Now, I'm going to be really heroic, but of course, it, that doesn't, I can't be wrong here because it might well be that my odds were right and just, you know. So my odd is uh, 64 against Trump. I believe people, I believe that people are wrong in assuming he's going to win this election. Uh, now, it could turn out to be, as I said, could, uh, these are the odds. And even if he wins, that doesn't prove my odds were wrong. Uh, <laughs> what it proves is, what would be interesting is if we could rerun re it um, a thousand times, then that would be quite interesting, but we can't. Uh, the po key point is <laughs> Trump is a very divisive figure, obviously, and it will be a very passionate election, and there will be clearly a very large number of passionate supporters. There's no doubt about that. We know that even in the Republican Party, a very significant proportion are not voting for him. You remember that. He's, he's really passionate support, really passionate support. He's something of like 25%, maybe 30% of the American electorate. And then, then you've got the people who will vote for him opposed to others. But there are a lot of people who are equally passionately opposed to him. And then the question is, will they come out? Will they vote for Biden? We don't know. But I think actually that it's quite plausible if you look at what happened in the midterms, which, in which the Republicans were expected to do rather well, that a lot of people will come out against him. So I think he has a fair chance of losing. Um, but of course, that, that doesn't mean he won't win. It's quite plausible. Um, and our third question came from the gentleman at the side um, about export finance budgets for the Baltics and for Ukraine. I'm not quite sure what you mean here. The, um, so I apologise for that. Ultimately, the, well, the Baltics are a different problem. Uh, um, so I'm going to put that to one side because it gets complicated. Yeah. Um, the... Uh, 
I mean, essentially, the money that goes... I mean, notionally, the money coming from Europe is supposed to be loans. Um, they can't be repaid unless we extract resources from the Russian assets we've seized. Uh, conventional export credits, which are supposed to be commercial, don't seem to me to work in these circumstances um, because we have no idea what the economy at the end of this will look like. Ultimately, when you're dealing with a war and the finance of a war uh, of indefinite duration in an economy, country being as damaged as this, any commercial type of operation, which is what export credit guarantees are supposed to be about, or that doesn't make sense. This has to be seen as on budget support by us, with the, in my view, is that um, the assets that we have seized from Russia should be used ultimately to, as part of the way of rebuilding Ukraine. But maybe I misunderstood the question, but that's my answer. OK, we will push on. Thank you. We've got about five minutes more because we started late. We're going to end a little later. Um, so a couple more questions, if I could. I've got a gentleman at the back there. Thank you. Just looking around here. And I saw gentleman's hand down here as well. Ah, and I've got, take this one over here, the man in the hat there. We've got a gentleman down here afterwards. First, would you? Thank you so much for this talk. Um, I would like to ask, what do you think uh, about uh, AI, uh, development of AI uh, capabilities, and will they impact the development gap between the global north and the global south? Thank you very much. Uh, and the gentleman here, if we could, thank you. Thank you to our microphone holders as well. Um, thank you, Martin, for your insights. Um, we spoke about the possible re-election of Donald Trump. I just want to talk about how we are potentially in the age of the strongman, you know, in China, um, Hungary of Orban, for example, Israel, Turkey of Erdogan. I'm going to push you for a question, sir. Um, my question is, how and why do these leadership styles emerge? OK. Uh, strongman. And, sir? Tagging on to the AI question. Assuming it's as big as something like the Industrial Revolution or something like that, what are social ramifications you see as happening? Excellent. And you can have 15 seconds on all of those. Uh, let's start, if we may, with um, AI, uh, the division between North and South. And, a, a, and, and a head, again, I suppose it's headlines, I'm afraid, um, on social ramifications. We've got about five minutes. So. <laughs> Oh, God. Uh, the, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, the first point is obviously uh, at this stage with a new set of technologies is we really don't know. Uh, and uh, um, the, um, and the, the real difficulty is they're going to affect so many different aspects of the economy and uh, society. The, um, I suspect that economically um, uh, the most important, ben and this I think is beginning to emerge, benefits arise where the AI and human skills are complementary, non-substitutive, non in which case it's, um, its effect on the relative um, um, benefits to developing and the develop high-income countries is rather ambiguous, uh, pretty obviously, because in this situation, it depends on the, it will depend on the ability of people in the developing world to use the technology really effective, the complementary side of all this. And, uh, and it's not clear to me that it will be decisive in shifting the um, competitive advantage in, on, towards either side. Um, there is the possibility that it will, um, yeah, th that's the first approximation. So I think at this stage we don't know um, which side will be most benefiting, benefited from it. It might lead to very large shifts against them. 
semi-skilled people, not the highest skilled people, in the middle of the income distribution, um, middle of the skill distribution, that seems to be the most plausible, but that could affect both of these sorts of economies in quite powerful ways. So I don't think it's really clear how it will affect it, and nor is it clear what the net job effects will be. I think, to me, the more obvious things is uh, in other areas, um, media, um, politics and all the rest of it. Mm -hmm. So at the moment, I think it's not clear. That's my view. Um, so tagging on from media and politics and the rest of it, the question from the gentleman, which could be a subject of an entire evening, about the social impact. Is it something that you spend a lot of time thinking about, the social impact of, of AI? I mean, as an economist, as someone who thinks about liberal democracies? Yes. Um, the the uh, um, I think... It seems to me plausible that it will further, trans first of all, further transform our media in very profound, possibly in very profound ways. Um, Maximise, increasing greatly the ease with which fakes of various kinds can be passed on. Uh, um, and uh, particularly societies with relatively open media, that could be relatively destructive. Uh, so I'm worried about that, so the information infrastructure of a democratic society is quite a big thing. Of course, if it does turn out to uh, devastate a lot of medium skill, medium middle class type jobs in uh, service sectors and so forth, that will also clearly have very, very large social, um, uh, social effects, uh, further magnifying things that have already, uh, already happened. Um, but I, again, I think it's not clear to me that we have a real sense of how big these effects are, are um, going to um, be. One of the points that is, you know, it's very clear, everybody's talking about hallucinations in using these large language models. They're a feature, they're not a bug. They're not something you can get rid of because the, the system doesn't understand what it's writing. And that makes it means that serious people doing serious things can't rely on it. And you know, that, of course, then depends, get, raises the question, well, what happens if unserious people doing serious things um, rely on it? Then we're going to have a number of rather serious catastrophes. And, and, and I wouldn't put it in any of these systems in charge of managing airplanes in the sky, for example. So we'll have to see how it's used. Okay. And we don't know. Uh, our last question um, came from a gentleman here about the rise of the strong man, which I know you've spent a bit oh, of time. Oh, yes, well, that comes, brings back to the strong man or strong point. woman, I should say. Uh, well, it's mostly strong men. Largely. Uh, the, that sort of vile phenomenon actually tends to be masculine. Now, uh, the... Well, you can think of this in two different ways. One is... And I've thought about this a lot. Okay. If you look at human societies, from what we know about, there is a very strong tendency for them over history, I'm talking about thousands of years, to be governed by strongmen. We call them kings or conquerors or you know, absolute monarchs and tribal chieftains and so forth. So maybe that's sort of what human beings want, which is terrifying. And the real exceptions are open democratic systems of any kind. And so we're just going back to what is quote unquote normal. Now this terrifies the wits out of me. And it, what I think of, God, I really don't want to get here. This is a debate I have with my wife. Yeah. <laughs> you know, as I, so I say, do you think fascism is the natural state of humanity? Question from me. And, and uh, so, so that's the first. The second thing is, if it isn't, People have to believe that deliberative, conscious processes of political debate and argument of the kind that are the central to the idea of democracy, the idea of citizenship, is something that they believe in. They feel they themselves are engaged in it, uh, and they feel that politics is responsive to this, and that the debates themselves are meaningful. And so that's the theme of my book. That we, and we've lost that. 
And if we've lost that, and I think it's obvious we've lost that, um, there are lots and lots of questionnaires and so forth, which I start with um, world value surveys which show that, then people start saying, well, if this system isn't responsive and the politicians are corrupt and useless, and all, well, at least if I've got a leader, I know what the leader wants to do. It provides precision, it provides order. Very important idea here. Um, and so you, even if you don't believe that quote unquote, fascism is the natural law of humanity. Democracy has to up its game to make that an intolerable option. And at the moment, we're not doing terribly well. We will end with the thought of democracy um, upping its game. I would... I'd like to thank... First of all, let me thank Martin for lovely conversation. Uh, stimulating thoughts. Thank you for coming here. Thank our audience online. Thank in particular Guinness Global Investors, whose assistance made the evening happening. That is all from us. Have a lovely evening. I may see some of you later. And good night. Thank you. Thank you.